morning, everybody, and welcome along to this edition of Lear Confidential on LearMedia.tv. And don't forget to press the red button on the right-hand side if you want to subscribe to our channel. It's free of charge. And we're absolutely delighted to have Professor Gary Murphy in studio with us this morning. Good morning, P uh, Professor Murphy. Good morning, Pat. Thanks for having me. Oh, he told me not to call him that, call him Gary, but we'll call him Gary. Now, Gary is... Um, Professor of Politics in the School of Law in UCD. He's published um, Electoral Competition in Ireland since 1987. Is that a misnomer? So there's no competition. <laughs> there's no choice. But <laughs> and The Politics of Triumph and Despair. And then also Regulating Lobbying and Global Comparison, 2010 and 2000, second edition, 2019. But for this edition, we're we're uh, concentrating on his book that came out at the end of last year on, I suppose, a giant of Irish politics. There's no doubt about this, C.J. Hawhey. But before we get into that, Gary, where did you grow up yourself? Uh, hi, Pat. Thanks for having me. I'm from Cork City. Uh, I grew up in the uh, in the inner city uh, in the... Uh, um, I was a child in the sort of um, the 70s and uh, into the 80s. And... Uh, my first uh, political memory, uh, as I write in the uh, in the book, um, was in 1979. I would have been uh, 10, I suppose, and I was coming home from school on a cold Friday morning, um, and we had a television, uh, an old, I think it was an old black and white, uh, in our house in uh, Evergreen Buildings. People uh, who were familiar with Cork's off barracks, right, right in the sort of middle of the city. And um, how he had won the um, the Fianna Fáil um, leadership. And my father, uh, my late father, who was a painter and then yeah. later the Cork uh, Harbour Commissioners, uh, let out a sort of an expletive, got, got him a stern rebuke from my mother. And uh, I was going, what the hell is going on here? And... Um, so I started watching the telly and I watched the news later that evening and um, uh, I wondered why this hockey character had made such an impact on my my, my relatively devout uh, father and um, I've sort of had an interest in him ever since. I then went to secondary school in sort of uh, the, the Christian Brothers. I was in Sullivan's Key. Deer Park was a secondary school and yes. I came under the influence of a number of uh, very inspiring history teachers and uh, that led me later to uh, UCC in 1987 when Hockey was just back as, as Taoiseach for the uh, uh, for the third time I studied history there and um, I later moved uh, moved to Dublin and I, I'm lucky enough to hold this position in uh, in DCU that I do uh, today. That's, uh, that's a lot of travelling, a lot of, I suppose, a fantastic uh, academic I suppose it's something that you were interested in, and they always say that if you're interested in I was always interested in history myself, but I didn't do much about it. Went all the but anyway, um, Hahi himself, obviously, I suppose from Danny Carney, as you say, to the t to being teacher, to be leader of Fianna Fáil, when you look at his background, both his parents, of course, as, as you say in your book, were from Derry. Yeah, yeah, they were from South Derry, yeah. So there is Swatra. Was it Swatra? Swatra, yeah. It would be kind of, um, I mean, to this day, it would be kind of strong Republican sort of Sinn Féin country, I suppose you would say. They would be quite strong uh, there. It was um, it was a hotbed of activity during the uh, uh, the War of Independence in 1919 uh, into 20. And both his parents, uh, Johnny Hockey and uh, Sarah Mac Williams, were uh, strong Republicans. Uh, Johnny Hockey uh, fought in the War of Independence, um, and uh, his uh, his girlfriend then, uh, Sarah Mac Williams, uh, she um, she would bring uh, clothing and food uh, to uh, to him and his uh, his comrades in uh, in the sort of South Derry Battalion of the old uh, IRA, and they began a sort of a romance and were married. Um, and not long after she, uh, his mother lived until um, 1989 and she moved, they, they moved to Donny Carney and we, we can talk about that, Pat. But uh, his father was um, a strong Michael Collins man. And there was yeah, a, yeah. I found, that, I found that a bit strange myself, but anyway, I, I didn't. Yeah, he that. was a strong um, Collins man. And uh, he, uh, so when the War of Independence ended and the Civil War, 
uh, after the Civil War, he, he, he stayed in the Irish Army. Uh, Hawhey was born in Castlebar in 1925 because Johnny Hawhey had been stationed there. Um, yes. and, but he was, uh, and then he, he left the Army in 1928 when Hawhey was just three. Uh, he was, to use the word in use at the time, invalided out of the Army uh, oh, because right. he, he had what we would now know as uh, multiple cirrhosis, uh, although he wasn't diagnosed at that at the time and he kind of suffered from uh some of his uh, his um army medical reports uh, say he suffered from nerves um and then the family sort of had a rather peripatetic existence they went they were in limerick for a bit they were in dublin they were in dunshockland and mead and finally in sort of 1933 um, they moved to the working class suburb of Dunny carney here on the north side of dublin yeah. Yeah, that was two up, two down, as they say, was it? Yeah, I mean, it was um, it was an interesting house. It was a it was a private dwelling, but in a kind of a, in the middle of a, a kind of of a of um, an estate of corporation houses. Yeah. It was uh, built in builders, uh, but it was very much uh, although it was advertised as a sort of a, a type of get a get, get get getting ahead housing development. It was very much a working class uh, area, and Hockey uh, and his family saw themselves as. Uh, as a working class. It was difficult though because when the, the father's illness progressed, um, money was sort of uh, tight. He just had his army pension. Um, yeah. Sarah Williams crazy. had her come in the month pension, but that was pretty little. And she had a little allotment uh, where she grew and sold uh, sold vegetables. Yeah. Um, so they had a lot of support, but yeah, it was a kind of a classic two up, two down type of house, yeah. And of course, you mentioned uh, how his mother who was a Mac Williams, and that's, as you know, well, after the, the, the connection all the way up to Monica. Yes, yeah, so and Monica Mac Williams is Charles Hockey's cousin, yeah. Her, uh, her father and um, Hockey's mother were uh, brother and sister, and uh, he he travelled um, up to Derry quite a lot as a child, which I write about in the in the book, uh, yeah. and uh, her father would uh, would collect him and his brothers from the trade, and it's very interesting. the The reason uh, they went up in the summer to Derry was basically to give their uh, uh, so that the mother, uh, Sarah McInnes, would have a bit of a break. Um, That's right. She so had, we were sent to, we, uh, we were sent to our, our grannies. Yeah, uh, she had seven children, and then she had a husband who was... Uh, she was had seven, yeah, she had seven children and a husband who, uh, who couldn't work, uh, yeah. basically. And he... Um, so the summertime was uh, where she could send them up to, to Derry Day. Um, they were sort of in their early teens, perhaps at this uh, stage, they played football. Yeah. Uh, they courted the local sort of uh, girls uh, and uh, they became part of the community. Uh, they were involved in uh, athletics and football and the like and uh, became part of, uh, of the sort of South Derry community. I, I went up there um, a couple of years ago for a few days. Yeah. Uh, sometime in the company of Monica's brother um sorry another cousin sorry Seamus McWilliams and he yeah. showed me the sort of the the old trench uh, that Johnny Hawhey and his comrades were enjoying the war of independence and um the <laughs> sort of the the, the background where uh, where Hawhey spent much of his uh, his childhood and that was a very interesting couple of days it would and of course it's formulated his um obviously his thinking as we know down through the years you know and uh, I was surprised he he, didn't, he never orientated towards joining Sinn Féin, although I suppose uh, Féin Fáil were the, the Republican Party. So yeah. they say that, uh, that De Valera was the complete cause of the Civil War. Yeah, yeah, well, that, 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 that is a pretty pretty contested notion, as you would know, to this uh, uh, to this day. The, the, I, I, would, I would say that. Yeah, the, the interesting thing, of course, about... Uh, uh, how he and his father and his father's sort of devotion uh, to Collins um, his, his nationalism was very strongly uh, oriented by his mother who was a very strong nationalist, uh, yes. a very strong believer in the United uh, but remember Sinn Féin of course were very weak Fianna Fáil was considered itself the uh, the Republican Party but when Hockey joins Fianna Fáil in 1948 much of it is because of his 
his circle of friends. He's friendly with Harry Boland, of course, whose father had fought um, in the uh, in the War of Independence and later the Civil War. So he's yeah. friendly. He's friendly with George Colley, uh, Harry Colley, uh, whose father Harry Colley had a similar background. Um, so he's friendly with a group of uh, of uh, people of similar age, um, and uh, there they sort of inspiration for him, I think, to join. Uh, Fianna Fáil. He certainly was, as we know, and we can talk about this later, his republicanism was quite uh, uh, quite strong and overt, but it, it, it brought him to Fianna Fáil. Now, there were allegations, not allegations, but there were uh, accusations that uh, how he was a sort of a Fianna Gaelor in disguise on the grounds that his father was a, uh, was a <laughs> Collins man. But I remember Maureen Hockey, um uh, Charles Hawley, his wife of some 50 years, uh, talking to me, uh, we, we spoke way back in 2014 uh, for about an hour or so. She was, at that stage, she was an elderly but very formidable woman. And yeah. she telling me that uh, her father, um, Sean Lamass, another veteran, of course, of the, the War of Independence, the Civil yeah. War, um, you know, saw nothing wrong with uh, with Hawley's father being a kind of a Collins man. Um, as, you know, some people, that was the way some people were. And uh, for that, I, there was a certain type of uh, one might call it a, perhaps a Fianna Fáil snobbery about uh, Hawhey's sort of uh, pedigree well yes uh, but Hawhey himself was a brilliant student I mean he was a very um, ar- articulate and a very intelligent man and of course he won a scholarship and uh, as you said uh, those friends of around him influenced him of course he had his own influence you said with his strong world but he was he won a scholarship to to secondary school, yeah. So in, in 1938, Hockey is about 12. Uh, he was born in 25, so he's uh, 12 going on 13. Yeah. And he comes first of 500 uh, primary school boys who sit Weird. the Dublin Corporation um, scholarship exam. And the in those days, as we know, there was no free secondary education. Oh. Um, so the, bit, the only way... Pri- um, working class boys could basically get to secondary school and girls was um, uh, through winning a Dublin Corporation uh, scholarship exams. His his mm-hmm. brother, Sean, had come second the previous year, 1937. Um, and there's a wonderful photograph, which I reproduce in the book from the Irish press uh, of August 38. Hockey is 12, he'd be 13 the following month um, yeah. of the young. And he was known as kind of cockle hockey in these days. Um yeah. Uh, of him, uh, uh, there's a little picture of him there on the front page of the Irish Press, which brought much uh, mirth. The Irish Press was the paper of choice in the hockey household, a uh, good, strong Fianna Fáil paper, as we uh, as I remember. As we, as we know. <laughs> and um, yeah, he was very smart, but also it's interesting because his secondary schooling in the famous Joey's uh, in Fairview, the um, another scholarship helped him to go from Joey's onto UCD, another Dublin Corporation scholarship. And he was a, he was a scholarship boy also in, uh, in UCD and not, not every, there was many who were not scholarship boys, including his great rival uh, of later years, Garrett Fitzgerald. Yes, indeed. Uh, the flawed pedigree man. As, uh, as well, Garrett. indeed. Yeah. There was, um, that was, guess, I think that left him down more than high, but anyway, that's not yeah, they knew each other from, um, for, for 40 years. I was interested. Yeah. They knew each other for about, um, yeah, 35 years at that stage. They knew each other in college. They, they hung around in sort of different uh, groups. They were definitely different social class. Uh, they had come from different social classes. Um, mm-hmm. And we can talk about that later on, but that certainly didn't go down well in the hockey uh, household at the time. I I suppose you get a sense, Gary, uh, reading your book, and I intend to finish it. Don't worry about that. I might come back for a part two. But... Um, when all the money, so so called money and wealth and stuff like that, you can. I'm not condoning anything. I'm saying you can understand why he did that because of his upbringing, why he felt he had to do some things like that. You know. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a, it's a controversial part of the of both the story of how he and indeed of the uh, of the the book. Um, he was very. He, much of his adult life was was shaped and molded by his straightened circumstances in yeah. uh, uh, that he grew up in. Uh, yeah. Like he saw, like his younger brother, for instance, Owen Hockey, 
uh, who I also interviewed before he died a few years ago, who was um, an oblate father um, in the um, the Red Dead Redemptorist priesthood. He never yeah. saw, for instance, his father walk. Um, and from a young age, they, the Hathi sons had to move the father and lift the father after the uh, when they were old enough to do so. So that certainly had, had a big influence on him. And he was mm. very keen then once he leaves university and he he, he sets up this accountancy firm, uh, Hahi Bolin with his friend Harry Bolin. He was very keen to make money. And certainly he liked money. He liked uh, the trappings that that money gave him. So he liked uh, the sort of, uh, he liked good Flash cars, one might say. He drove a Jaguar rather implausibly in the late 1950s. As one would. Uh, and he also, and so he, and he had, uh, a, they first had a house in the Hope Road and then they lived in Grangemore and later in this, the Gandon, uh, James Gandon, as I mentioned in, in Abbeville. But he did certainly like the, um, like the, uh, the, 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 the wealth. Uh, the trouble for him, of course, was that much of that wealth wasn't generated by him. It was given to him by by others. He never thought this would uh, become public, and uh, it does, of but, course, with uh, when the Dun scandal comes in. Yeah, did others think they were <laughs> contributing not alone to High but to Fianna Fáil? You know, yeah, that's... people like Ben Dunn, for instance. You know, yeah. I mean. You'd be giving it, obviously, you might be a personal friend of the particular politician, but you'd also consider yourself a being supporter of the party. Yeah, that's true. And I think one of the difficulties for Hockey was that um, money meant for the, for the party ended up in, uh, in his accounts. Um, and the, the, the sort of defence he gave later in the tribunal was that... Uh, there was all these intermingling of uh, of accounts, and one of the difficulties he did face was that uh, a number of people said money given to the party ended up with him. And then there was the very famous path, of course, uh, Brian Lenehan saga when uh, uh, Hockey arranged through uh, his fundraiser, uh, Paul Kavanagh, the idea that they would raise the money so that Brian Lenehan could get his liver operation. Yeah. Uh, he did get his liver operation, but much more money was was. Um, uh, was raised and the excess went into Hockey's uh, account, and that was a that was a, a pretty low point for him during his life. When the tribunal, when this was all aired uh, in the tribunal, he had he had a very strong defence to say Brian Lennon needed his operation. I'm the one who arranged it, uh, and yeah. he took grave offence. But but he did leave himself certainly open to uh, to yeah. allegations that yeah. money money meant for Fianna Fáil or for Brian Lennon's fund ended up in his uh, his bank accounts. And you would think uh, that um, he being a trained accountant, you would think that he, you know, the High Boland was a huge firm. Yeah. That yeah. these money, they can be organised, um, as we know, I mean, down through the years with the famous Ansbacker accounts and all of that crack. I mean, he was a, a chartered accountant and um, I don't know how he would think that money sitting in an account would not be discovered. Yeah, I mean, I do think there is a kind of a kink there, uh, a fault. I mean, so his, his, in, in the 1960s, um, the mid sort of 1960s, when he becomes a, a minister, a minister for justice, first and agriculture, he let much of the finances run, what was run by this man, Des Trainer, who did set up the Ansbacker accounts. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, Trainer had been appointed by, by Hockey uh, Boland. Um, and Hockey always claimed that he had left his, his affairs. Uh, but we do know that I did personally have a number of meetings with uh, with AIB in the late 70s. And he said he could be a very difficult opponent uh, for, for them. And he was he was in spectacular debt um, by, his, um, by the end of his 30s, into his 40s. So basically... When he buys in his for instance, 1974, he buys the island off the Blaskets for, for um, off the Kerry Coast, the Blasket Islands for, yeah. for 25,000 pounds. He was 600,000 pounds in debt. This is 600,000 pounds in 1974. That had grown to a million by, well, the, time he's, by the time he's appointed uh, Taoiseach. So mm -hmm. this is, his accountancy background certainly wasn't any, uh, uh, didn't stop him getting into a uh, colossal debt. There are people that are not exonerating Charlie Hyde. There are people that debt uh, sits on very easily. There I, are. 
I, I don't mean that now as a trite comment or as a, an exonerating comment. People can carry debt very easily. Some yeah. people. Yeah. And like you and I, you and I would hardly go outside the door, some of our personality, if we, you know, we have to be nearly in disguise. But some people, and how he is proof of that, he, he was able to compartmentalize that aspect of his life and be a very, very effective minister, no matter what ministry he got. And he sat in all, nearly all the senior ones. Yeah, that's true. I and mean, that's a very good way of looking at it. The idea of, uh, and I suppose I hadn't considered it myself that way, the idea of debt sitting easily uh, with him, because he does sell bits of land um, yeah. to, to pay off some of his debts, other than he accumulates more, um, well, he accumulates fine wines and paintings and uh put a swimming pool into his house um, and re refurbishes Abbeville. Um, and yeah, and debt did sit uh, rather easily with him. He uh, And it never stopped him spending. Um, and nope. it was all the stuff about Charvé shirts and the Cockardy is one part Absolutely. of it. But it did not stop him um, living the lifestyle to which he had become very accustomed to by his... Uh, yeah. Uh, by the time he enters politics in the late 50s into the 1960s. So that is a good way of looking at it, Pat. The idea that debt was... Uh, uh, sat uh, sat easily uh, on him, and it, yeah, and sure. I I make the point in the book, although and some people have kind of criticised this, but you know I I remain uh, uh, strongly of the view that how he was able to compartmentalise the different sides of his uh, of his life, and uh, uh, he yeah, and, and politics was what drove him. Um, a money he see considered a sort of uh, he, he needed to have it. Uh, but it was ephemeral in relation to the sort of the political drive um, that I think consumed. Yeah. And of course, uh, he was. Did you ever meet him? No, no, I didn't. Um, uh, funnily enough, uh, you know, uh, uh, for some reason or other, I never, uh, I didn't meet him um, <laughs> in my <laughs> earlier sort of academic uh, yeah, career. Yeah. But, uh, but I do think I've got to sort of to know him very well in the uh, over the course of the last seven or eight years. As I said, I was at a rally with, with my dad, I think. Uh, I know it's my mom there now. And uh, there was a couple of hundred there packed into a hotel. I won't say where, but uh, well, it was in Cork. And... He wasn't a big man, as you know, physically. Yeah, he was very small, yeah, about five foot seven, but yeah. I'll tell you one thing. The very minute he came into the room, even if you couldn't physically see him, you'd know he was in the room. I know that sounds stupid now. You'd know he's arrived. And he never, he had a, a fan, what a highly intelligent, never forgot your name. Never yeah, he forgot did. your name. Yeah, that's very interesting. He had, a, he had, he did have a very natural uh, charisma about him, uh, mm -hmm. and he um, and people were drawn uh, to him, and he was able to work crowds uh, unlike pretty much anybody else. Um, he wouldn't forget people's names. You're quite right. Um, and uh, even even yesterday, I was um, I saw on Twitter. Uh, that great modern medium, uh, Barry Cohen, the TD, put a, a, an, a, an unbelievable picture uh, on Twitter, basically of hockey uh, getting out of a helicopter in Offaly uh, and literally being mobbed by this group of people. Um, there's a great picture of a woman of about much the same age, perhaps, running over him with her arms out like this. And she uh, to hug him, and uh, he did. He did spawn this incredible uh, devotion. Now he also spawned uh, hatred in equal measure, perhaps, from his opponents. Uh, but many people were judged, were drawn to his uh, his personality, uh, his charisma. It's quite uh, unlike anyone now, really. I think in uh, in political life. And it's only since I since you agreed to this interview that I've come to look at uh, at him in in detail myself. Because I mean, even though I knew him and I and, and I met him twice, and not know him, but I met him yeah, in yeah. his era. I mean, I had forgotten about the ministries he served and the effectiveness he did in every single one of them. He did good in every politically speaking. He must have been disappointed to serve or to see Jack Lynch, probably one of the worst t shirts that were ever in Fianna Fáil, you know, serving uh, leading the party. Yeah, he um, so how he is um, he's elected first in 1957. He becomes a minister, of, uh, first of all, a parliamentary private secretary minister for state and then minister for justice mm. uh, in the early 60s. And that's a very 
where it's a very dynamic period for him. I mean, lots lots of those um, lots of people listening to us will uh, will know of the Succession Act. Um, he was again yes. driven by his mother's experience, the idea that she could be written out of the sort of the family home uh, against her will. That had a big impact uh, on him. But he reforms things like uh, the death penalty, uh, the Guardianship of Infants Act. I mean, he does he does a lot uh, in a short period of time. He then goes to agriculture, and this is where the first issue with Lynch arises. They have a yeah. big row about subsidies, um, and he's very unhappy with Lynch as minister uh, for uh, for finance. And agriculture is a difficult period for him, um, because although he had a chicken farm himself, uh, he uh, he had an antagonistic relationship with the the National Farmers Association, yes. who many, of course, in Fianna Fáil saw as sort of. Uh, Blue shirts on tractors as kind of Fine Gaelers, basically. Well, they did, yeah. They were, that's what they were. I mean, that's what I was told. I was a small yeah. black school. That's a blue a blue shirt house. Uh, the, the other farmers, you, you don't yeah. really consort with them. Only with yeah, so he, he had a difficult relationship uh, with them. And then there's the, then there's the leadership in 1966. He thinks the, when Lamas uh, resigns, yes. he thinks of going, but he doesn't run in the end. And Jack Lynch kind of a compromised figure is uh, wins the election over George Colley. And how he was always of the view, uh, basically, that Lynch uh, was his intellectual inferior. Uh, he didn't think Lynch had also much of a work ethic. How he was con- consumed by work, where he thought Lynch uh, somewhat lazy, to put it bluntly. Um, and um, and he was very disappointed uh, that uh, Lynch became the, um, uh, the Taoiseach. No, he did. Lynch makes him Minister for Finance. He uh, does. And, and again, he, he has does. a very successful couple of years as Minister for Finance. Uh, the country, uh, he puts the country into, into credit uh, for the first time in the foundation of the, the state. And then there are things like the artist tax exemption. Uh, yeah, free, that's true. Free travel. Uh, he's also part of the, um, when Dunno O'Malley brings in free education, hockey is the one who then ultimately sort of finds the, uh, finds the money and there, there's a sort of a lot going on. He runs the Fianna Fáil campaign for um, in the 1969 general election when Lynch is uh, when, when Fianna Fáil won this big uh, majority, uh, and then his career is brought to this kind of shuddering halt by the uh, ever controversial um, issue of the uh, the arms, uh, well, the invasion of arms, and the arms trial. As Minister for Finance, there was a fund set up. Uh, as as you mentioned in your book as well, of a hundred thousand yeah. pounds, which is an awful lot of money to help the people in the six counties, mainly the Catholic population, because it was really, really. I mean, I'll tell you, I was in the army myself from sixty nine to seventy three. We were getting ready to be bussed up to the right. to the border. <laughs> Remember that? We were woken up at three o'clock in the morning, but um, and um, that was a turbulent time. I understand. Uh, Hahi and Boland and them, I understand uh, why they wanted to do what they, what they were trying to do. I understand where they were coming from. I'm not saying right or wrong. People will always have opinions on it. Yeah, yeah. You know, because, I mean, if you lived in the six counties that time, it was brutal. Because every Roman Catholic was assumed to be an IRA man or woman. Yeah, I mean, it, it's very interesting. I mean, and of course, how he has been alleged to have sort of like funded and, and began the uh, the uh, the IRA, the, the modern uh, version, the 1969 uh, version. Um, the first interesting thing about him is that the whole cabinet, including him, uh, how he himself are surprised when the, the troubles erupt. Uh, in Derry and later Belfast, uh, yes. there is this great fear of, of pogroms in the uh, in the north. And as you say, uh, Catholics had been sort of uh, seriously denied civil rights for 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 decades. There's also this fear that there'll be a uh, in, uh, an influx of refugees across the border. Uh, so it's all it's a very kind of um, frenetic period. Um, Ahahi and Blaney are uh, are certainly involved in trying to divert the disperse funds mm. and then the big question is to this day to what extent did uh, Hockey uh, and Lynch uh, on the other side know about the uh, alleged importation of arms to yes. um, and the question about the arms is A whether 
how he knew they were arms in the first place, or yeah. B, whether he assumed they were for uh, official use, or whether, as his critics say, they were for uh, use by the uh, by the provisionals. And I looked at his papers, um, yeah. and I, I mean, you had access to. To his archive, yeah. His archive is here in DCU. It'll be open to the public later uh, this year. We'll start opening it in, in sort of tranches. Um, and there's a two boxes, Pat, called Arms Child. And you go, God, I must look at them straight away. Um, wow. They're not widely um, exciting. A lot of the bits to do with sort of strategy in terms of, of the trial itself. There are lots of sort of witness statements. Sorry for the- was there much of a paper trail? Was it all phones, or was it much of a paper trail? Yeah, no, there, there is, there's not a huge paper trail. There, and a lot, <laughs> and a lot of his, a lot of his correspondence, uh, when things kind of get um, on controversial issues, he might say, uh, "Give me a ring about this on whatever number his uh, his personal oh, number oh, was." Yeah. Um, and so the debate then was to what extent Hockey uh, knew about the um, about his importation of guns. Now the critical point is um, the critical period is April May of 1970 he has this horse riding accident there was all these allegations that he had been beaten up uh, after being caught in flagrante by a by a jealous husband and that husband's sons there's no evidence for that at all um I, no, I, I, I think at this remove just have to know I think yeah, this well both both Maureen Hockey and Hockey's daughter Emma Mulhern told me uh, and I have it on tape uh, that they were there on the morning he fell off his horse. Uh, he hit his head trying to grab onto a, a gutter oh, pipe yeah. and uh, was a badly injured and was moved from Abbeville to uh, to the, the matter. But the point is, a week later, uh, Lynch goes to see him, puts these allegations to him after Lynch had been notified uh, yes. by um, by Liam Cosgrave. How he denies uh, uh, any impropriety. But once he's out of hospital, Lynch sacks him. And then a couple of months later, of course, uh, much to Hockey's uh, dismay, chagrin and uh, fury, he is charged um, by um, by the then uh, Attorney General. There's no direct pro- public prosecutions in these days with the, the illegal importation of arms. Now, he was, when you think of it, it was an extraordinary scandal, Pat. Here we had uh, yeah, one of the most... You had more than one. You had a couple of senior ministers who were thrown out. Yeah, well, Blaney uh, was also, uh, he was uh, also sacked. And then Kevin Bowden resigned in sort of sympathy with Hawi. But, I mean, the scandal was extraordinary because Hawi was the minister for finance. Um, You know, a a man certainly who wanted to be Taoiseach, perhaps the second most important man in the the cabinet after uh, Lynch. He is uh, sacked just out of of hospital. uh, And then he's charged. And He's 45 years of age now at this stage, remember. And That's right. He, he, but the important thing there is, like, and I think some people who've written about this period kind of forget this, um, his liberty is at stake. I mean, it would depend on the judge, but he, when he's put on trial, he could have faced anything up to 10 years in jail. Now, that was, uh, that was a very difficult time uh, for him. And I tend to think, A, there's no evidence strong evidence that Hockey uh, in any way, shape or form wanted uh, to arm uh, the IRA. I think it's also implausible that Lynch didn't know uh, what was uh, going on in relation to the importation of arms for defensive purposes. In other words, if, if the North had completely spilled yes. uh, spilled over, uh, I, I outlined this. People, people forget that time that there was a, um, a real, real fear. Yeah. That it would meet that we'd meet at our doors. I mean, there was a real fear. I mean, in 68, 69, 70, it was, there was uh, loads and loads of uh, Hong Kong refugees came down and they were housed in Kilbert Camp and all, you know. Yeah, yeah. Huge amount of displacement of population as well. People, you can forget that now, 50 years ago, uh, but uh, really, it was a very Tough time for people. It was a difficult time. And then it was made much worse for Hockey when he when he faced this, this trial. Yeah. The first trial is uh, is abandoned. Um, and then the second trial in September into October of 1970, he uh, uh, he is acquitted ultimately by a jury of his peers in um, just under two hours after a rather a dramatic trial. He's put on trial with uh, three other people, uh, Captain James Kelly, 
John Kelly, a Belfast Republican, and uh, this intermediary, a guy called Albert Lux, uh, who was basically the man charged with importing the arms. Neil Blaney had originally been charged, but the charges against him were dismissed in circumstances that are still a bit unclear because, as far as I can tell, the evidence seems to be much stronger uh, that Blaney was in cahoots with... uh, with Lux, then certainly Hottie was, who barely, I think, had only met him once uh, socially, according to himself. But the trial is very dramatic. Um, he's acquitted, and then he calls for Lynch to basically to do the honourable thing. Uh, but the cabinet rallies around uh, Hottie, and he is kind of cast. He's cast into the uh, into the political wilderness, so to speak. You know, Gary, at that stage, I mean, as you said, he was 45, 1970. I mean, any... Other politician, and he, of course, he's himself, any other politician would say, really, I think I'll find something else to do, you know? Yeah, or, yeah. You know, with, with all of this turbulence, but as we mentioned earlier on, i still convinced, I, I don't know why I'm saying it, of his character that he was able to put that in the box and put it away. Well, he was completely. It's and extraordinary. Carry on, carry on extraordinary political career. Yeah, it's amazing. Kevin Boland had left Fianna Fáil and set up this new party. Um, he wanted uh, Hockey to join that party and Blaney. Uh, Hockey considered it, but very briefly and quickly dismissed it. I mean, Hockey wanted to be Taoiseach, uh, very much so. He, he wanted to be leader of Fianna Fáil. Yeah, he wanted to be leader of Fianna Fáil, exactly. Um, and he knew Fianna Fáil, excuse me, Pat, was bigger than he was. Uh, and that the only way he could be lead, the only way he could be T-shirt was to be leader of Fianna Fáil in the first place. So he swallows his medicine. He kind of goes into this wilderness, and then he goes on the famous rubber chicken circuit, talking to uh, coming all across um, from West Cork up to East Donegal, uh, all over Ireland. The, the, the ironic thing is, he would never have let anyone go into his constituency uh, to speak um, who wasn't. Uh, um, yeah, so he uh, and he is ultimately brought back uh, to the front bench by Lynch in January of seventy five. But certainly, uh, there were there was a dark enough old period. Um, he had talked right. about leaving and maybe going into business, but no, he was consumed by politics. Really, and he visited uh, hundreds and hundreds of common. He did. He visited. Uh, I don't want to be try. The real people of Fianna Fáil, the people who, like my dad and my mum, who walked the streets and the byways and the highways, who collected the half crowns and the tin shilling. Yeah. yeah. Ronaldo, and they got to know him. It's very, yeah, exactly. I mean, him, PJ Mara, who I also spoke to for this book before he sadly died, he would tell me of their, their journeys, how he did. They drove fearfully fast on bad roads. Uh, they had a few scrapes and whatnot. And he, um, yeah, and there, there was, I mean, you wouldn't go as far to say, like, from right from the start, there was a plan to make him T-shirt, but it was a kind of a subliminal yeah. view that, you know, they weren't doing this just because they were invited up to no. going to Kilworth, let's say, or over to, uh, you Absolutely. know, uh, Roscommon or whatever. Like, they were doing this. There was an end game, and it was to link hockey with the, uh, the people who uh, could put in place and vote in Fianna Fáil backbenchers who would later vote for him in uh, for leader. And that is, of course, yeah. what happens in 9, December of 79. In 79, then, uh, there was... Um, that Lynch resigned. Yeah. He and, um, he... and, of course, you still had Collie. Yeah, Collie and Collie and Hawhey, of course, uh, oh, were... Uh, is, he, is he the forgotten man of Fianna Fáil? Well, he is. I mean, for... Uh, it's very interesting. I mean, people are always talking about how he's ambition and how he was desperately keen to be Taoiseach and whatnot. Um, remember, it was George Colley who forced a leadership election in 1966 and was against Lynch. And in, or sorry, yeah, exactly. So Lynch in 79 is, you know, he's he, at this stage, he's had 13 years as leader. He's kind of tired of it. Um he loses those two by-elections in, in Cork City. You know, it's just kind yes. of a, there's an apathy there. Uh, he's had enough, basically. He wants to sort of retire. Um, he's desperate for Collie to succeed him, and he, he calls, basically, a leadership election just two days long um, with the anticipation that Collie would win that 
uh, and the short election time frame would would kind of snooker uh, uh, hockey. Of course, what happens is completely the opposite. Hockey wins because people like Michael O'Kennedy and Ray McSherry, Kennedy's in the cabinet, uh, Ray McSherry is a minister for state. It's, both of them were assumed to be in the Kali camp. They vote, vote for Hockey. He wins by six votes, 44 uh, to 38. And he wins because the backbenchers of 77, those people who were, and those common who had invited him, to, uh, where the he went, they, were, they were his people, basically. And, yeah. um, and that came as a huge shock, to, including to my father, to my late father, to much of Ireland, that yeah. Hockey would, you know, only a decade, not even a decade after being... Uh, arrested and put on trial, would be the leader of uh, Fianna Fáil and the Taoiseach. And then he faces, in the door on Tuesday, the 11th of December, the flawed pedigree stuff comes up. It's an incredible story. Of, it of, is, yeah. It's an incredible story, whatever but the other things, we're not dismissing it, but of a man who was, as I said, in 1970, who was dead and buried. Yeah. But it is an incredible story, and he. You know, it did take his toll. I mean, he's a human being after all, with his family and all that. But to ascend to that uh, in less than a decade again, to be leader of Fianna Fáil. Yeah, and I mean, it, it's funny, like Fianna Fáil now at fourteen percent, and you know, whatever thirty odd seats, thirty eight seats. I mean, Fianna Fáil then was, you know. 45, close to fifty percent of the vote uh, in some elections. Um, well, it was a national pastime for for for, for thousands and thousands Lynch, of people. Jack Lynch himself got twenty thousand plus votes. John York City, yeah, uh, and how he get high would have these huge votes in uh, in Dublin North uh, Northeast. But Fianna Fáil was a kind of, um, I mean, it was part of people's psyche, and it was an extraordinary achievement. Uh, and it it goes to a tremendous drive. Yeah. determination, a single-mindedness of purpose uh, for Hockey. Um, and then when he is when he is nominated for T-shirt, there are all these attacks on him by uh, Frank Kluski and Noel Brown, and particularly Gareth Fitzgerald, the famous flawed pedigree uh, statement. Fitzgerald always said afterwards he didn't mean it in relation to a social snobbery, that it was uh, Hockey had half a Fianna Fáil uh, against him. But he wouldn't have said it about George Colley, for instance, who also no. would have had if he had won by two or three votes, would also have had half Fianna Fáil against him. And, I, I, and I certainly, this girl did regret saying it afterwards. Um, and then Hockey is Taoiseach uh, in December of 79. And the difficulty there for him, Pat, is he's had to climb, he's at the top, and then it's like, what the hell do I do? Sort of, no. And he's unprepared or <laughs> ill-prepared for the difficulties uh, he faces as Taoiseach. The economy is in the doldrums after the start of the second oil crisis and uh, the Spina Fall Manifesto of 77 hamstrings, hamstrings him and, and the party and then you have these extraordinary series of elections in the early 80s um, which he found uh, very difficult Well, uh, of course I'd forgotten about Frank Kluski I, had a, I was a great admirer of Frank Kluski Yeah I just I don't know. There was something very admirable about the man. I, I thought he was an honest socialist. Well, he was. He was very much. So, but during the um, during that debate, he pleaded with the Fianna Fáil, uh, uh, those who opposed Hockey in the election, he pleaded with them not to vote for him as, uh, as Taoiseach. Now, that fell on deaf ears because of the sort of partisan nature of Irish politics. Um, but it was, uh, it was interesting. Maureen Hockey told me Oh, yeah. That Hockey told her and his mother, you know, that he would this this would be a difficult. Uh, yeah. It was a great honor, for, of course, their son and husband becoming a uh, T-shirt, but that it would be they were in for a rough few hours. But I don't think they thought it would be as bad as it uh, as it was, and it, it hurt him quite deeply. He led four governments: dolls, yeah. 16, 18, 20, and twenty-first dolls, like Hockey yeah. himself. Now, some of them, were, one of them, was very really shocked. But yes, so he's teach he's teacher from December seventy nine until June of 80, uh, 81. Um and he's desperate to fight an election. Uh there's the Stardust tragedy in February of eighty one, which stops him calling right. an earlier election. And yeah. then there's the, there's the hunger strikes. Um and he calls an election in the middle of the uh, of the hunger strike. And this is a very this is a bad political mistake. Ray McSharry said, Don't do it, we're up to our necks with uh, you know. Uh, black uh, flags hanging from street poles, um, right. and, and certainly it came as a surprise when they when the uh, 
two. Kieran Doherty wins a seat in Kevin Monaghan. Paddy Agnew wins a seat in Lode uh, for the H blocks. And Phil right. Paul lose a number of seats. How he is consigned to opposition. He's back in in February of 82 in a very controversial government, February to November 82. He's got the Falklands crisis, but he's also in the phone tapping thing. Uh, um, the whole <laughs> boo boo. There's the Malcolm oh, MacArthur gang in the summertime. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a mad period, really. Do you remember the programme Nighthawks? Yes, indeed. Do you remember, uh, you saw them with a few drinks. Was it Sean? Sean and Doherty, yeah. So Doherty and Nighthawks. Had, with, yeah. with, 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 with uh, Healy. Yeah. Healy. He spilt the beans there. Yeah, so there's another, there's a big, and again, I, I go into this in some detail in the book. So that was in 1992. That was January of 92. And Doherty, and it was an odd old programme, Nighthawks, as it was filmed in the pub. And there's people in the background having drinks and whatever. And he he told Shea Healy, I'm saying something very important here. So basically the story is uh, that Doherty said uh, that the phone taps he authorised on the journalist Bruce Arnold and uh, Geraldine Kennedy yeah. um, were uh, were sanctioned by Hockey. Hockey had always denied that he ever knew of these uh, phone tapping. And the interesting thing is the Hockey story says the same. It's Doherty who changes his mind between 82 and 92. Most people tend to believe that it was implausible that Hockey wouldn't know or didn't know uh, about these phone tappings. But in January of 92, when it arises, the sort of writing is on the wall for, for Hockey. Albert Reynolds had been thinking for, for months, had resigned from the cabinet or had been sacked by Hockey from the cabinet um, and was, you know, was wait, willing, willing, to, waiting for an opportunity to challenge Hockey. So Hockey ultimately falls on his own sword in February of 92, bringing a kind of an end to a, a, an extraordinary political uh, career. It was yeah. interesting then, Pat, he, he didn't want to leave, but he left after the, the phone tapping thing comes up and he thought he was heading into a relatively sedate uh, retirement, but it turned out to be anything. Uh, but when the tribunal uh, stuff, uh, when the tribunals came, knocking all to the Terry Keane business when that was, when that became public knowledge. Well, the, the sweetie pie on the late head show. But before that, I love this speech in the doll. I've done the state some service. You know? yeah, yeah, he was very fond of quoting Shakespeare and I quote Shakespeare in the book myself. <laughs> He was a he great was, man to quote Shakespeare. I'll, and, uh, I'll, be killed. I'll be killed when my dad sees this, but I was a classic. Yeah, he, um, and, uh, you know, it was a certain bit of hubris. Like, I mean, how he didn't, um, the interesting thing about his background, which we discussed earlier, but... Uh, <laughs> He didn't have self-confidence issues, Hockey. I mean, some people talk about that Hockey have an inferiority complex because he no. came from such straightened... Uh, no. Not at all, I don't think. No. Um, and he, he does, does make this... And it's interesting, he gets a rousing um, round of applause uh, and then he sort of disappears into, back to Abbeville to lead a, what is relatively nice retirement or the sedate you know, he has grandchildren come along he plays with them and he, his horse racing is a big passion sailing is a big passion uh, well, and then then it all goes spectacularly <clears throat> pear-shaped when uh, when the ben dunn family saga unravels and the money becomes it becomes known that how he had received well up to nine million afterwards the moriarty tribunal um was it that high the moriarty tribunal rest, estimated about nine million just over nine um, was that was that a guess? They 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 it was a guess, um, but they they did uncover you know very large uh, large payments, and and it, it, they they thought it could well have been. Of course, been Gary, it wasn't the only thing the foreign minister for finance. It was another fella had no bank account. Oh yeah, of course, his protege. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, protege. there's for, there's foreign in, in that thing of our party. <laughs> And also, I mean, Hockey wasn't the only politician to have debts written off by, by the banks. In fact, his great uh, adversary, Gareth Fitzgerald, had debts written off uh, by uh, by the banks. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, he certainly wasn't the, um, it wasn't the only, but, but the great problem for Hockey, and I think he stands indicted on this path, is that um, he accepted the money um, of sort of the uh, Ireland's wealthy elite as if it was his due it wasn't that he 
accepted money and then did political favours uh, for them. There's no evidence of that, although the tribunal do try to make a, a number of claims, which then the Hawhey family rejected. Uh, but he did leave himself seriously wide open um, because he never thought it would happen. He never thought, and, and this goes back to your point about his accountancy training. And he, of course, he was also trained as a barrister he never practiced but he he, he had a degree barrister bar, barrister degree uh, and there was um there was a uh, how will i put this uh, a blind spot uh, about this and uh, when when it becomes when it's discovered it's a very dark the last few years of his life are, are very painful the terry Keane thing is she goes on the late late show reveals the existence of a long-standing extramarital uh, affair um, and again, that's very difficult. But Maureen was a great source of uh, his wife was a great sort of solace and comfort to him during what were very, very difficult days. Well, I mean, I don't know about. I think that I'm, I'm just trying to formulate a question about it. All the money that he got. As you said, there was a, there may be a sense of entitlement. He yeah. may be, it may be as simply explained as they're giving me money. Oh no, no yeah, no. He he he. Um, and I take the money. He needed the money anyway because of the. the of, life. Hadn't yeah. he a connection to his daughter with horses anyway? Oh yeah, well, oh, very much so. No, he was. Um, you know, I mean, there there was that. What yeah, was his horse that won so, some races? Bashing steel. Blessing steel. Yeah, yeah, he won the 1993 Irish Grand National. It was very interesting. Hockey's yeah. father, to go back to where we started, Johnny Hockey yeah. was a very, very accomplished horseman in the Irish Army. And oh, Hockey, right. yeah, very accomplished horseman. And Hockey's daughter, Emer, and his son, Connor. Connor represented Ireland at uh, junior sort of uh, show jumping. Uh, so yeah. they were very accomplished uh, sporting family. And Hockey himself was a very very sporting type. He was a very good underage horror oh, footballer, and um, he um, and he was very and uh, horse and he he was um, he was a breeder and owner of horses. But horse racing was expensive, um, and uh, he, need, he needed the money certainly. Um, and he strongly advocate uh, argued at the tribunals, um, and he he like and he's the interesting thing for listeners um, and viewers is that. He's getting much sicker, of course. Uh, he has cancer from 1994, so he's getting sicker when he's when he's at these tribunals. His, his um, he appears over 30 times there in sort of one hour blocks, and yeah. there's a dispute between his legal team and the, the tribunal's team about when he can appear. Uh, but he's very strongly defends his actions that. Yes, he had got varieties of money. He couldn't remember how much exactly, but that he never did a political favour uh, for it. Now, the, argue, the counter-argument is, well, he created the conditions um, by accepting the money. But he was very strong himself right to the end of his days that, that he had never taken a political position or influenced public policy uh, corruptly, I suppose one would say. And Gary, I mean, being a historian yourself and teaching history, I mean, tribunals to me are for rich people. Uh, a poor person who uh, maybe right, maybe might get into debt of half a million, they'd be jailed for them, no tribunal. Would that be too simple? No, no, I think there's a very fair point there, uh, Pat. I, I think that is a, a reasonable uh, point. And, and remember how he was... Um, there was a there was a criminal investigation launched into whether he had obstructed the uh, the McCracken tribunal in the first place uh, or not, um, and the um, and the, those charges were preferred against him in 1999, and you might remember uh, Mary Harney scuppered him when she said publicly that oh. Hockey should go to jail. Uh, yeah. before he had even faced a trial. So he he then couldn't have a fair trial. So that, that collapsed. Two feet now. <laughs> yeah, so that uh, that collapsed. Um so that's um so it's yeah, I like I I no I don't think your point she, is too simple. She's now uh, down here in UL. That's right, yeah, as the Chancellor. But she um she uh, that was a very odd thing to do on the grounds of like no one in public life really should be prejudging uh did she uh, do it on purpose? I don't think so. 
I don't think so. Uh, she was a formidable enemy of hockey's, of course, because she was very close to Des O'Malley. She left during the Anglo-Irish Agreement uh, when uh, Fianna Fáil opposed it, and she thought this was outrageous. And she left with with her, when O'Malley was was basically uh, turfed out uh, for yeah. conduct unbecoming, as he uh, famously wrote about in his own book of the same title. Um, yeah. No, I I think she was no. She did. She does go to his funeral um, in two thousand and six. She's tarnished at the time. Uh, but she was um, she was an implacable enemy of him, so I don't think she did it to try and get him off. So I wouldn't be of that uh, of that. That was a mistake. I think so, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I mean, there was a lot of um, there was a lot of public anger against him. I mean, when the uh, because I think many people had assumed that you know he had made his money through various land deals and business acumen, and when it was revealed that he was to large purposes a kind of a kept man, um, I, there was an awful lot of public anger uh, to uh, towards him. Um, and uh, but, you, you remember Pat when he went to Cork for Jack Lynch's funeral in nine, in, in October of 1999. He's booed uh, by those lying in the streets. Now that was again a very very difficult uh, time. He he felt, although he didn't have much time for Lynch, as we know and as we talked about, he felt duty bound to go. Um, he had known Lynch for oh. forty years. Uh, oh. so, and he felt that as a former T-shirt, he should also go to the funeral of a former T-shirt. But uh, it was a very difficult, uh, difficult time uh, for him. And that, after, must been, that must have been very, on a personal note. I mean, on a personal all, level, it was extremely difficult. Yeah, we're all human beings. And, uh, yeah, his, his, son Connor, his son Connor told me that uh, one of Connor's great regrets was that he didn't go with him on the day. He basically just went with his driver. Um, the, uh, former Taoiseach still had state drivers in these days. Yeah. Um, he also was like, at this stage, hockey is about, uh, what age was he then? Uh, near, like He was in his mid-70s, and really it was, uh, Connor always told me he regretted, uh, I write about this in the book. Um, but at a personal level, yeah. And then the last few years of his life are just, very difficult. He spends them in public disgrace, the tribunal stuff, the Terry Keane stuff. Um, he's then getting sicker as well, and he uh, he has to see a consultant, a, a, a cancer country as an oncologist. He sees uh, on a weekly basis. Um, he's just getting much frailer, and he, he is a virtual recluse uh, in Abbeville. Various people go to see him, uh, people he yeah. has served, who have served him as both in politics and in the civil service, uh, People like Vincent Brown go to see him. Um, That's true. It, it's a tough, it's a tough ending um, because you know, I, uh, do, I, I drove a taxi for a living a few, for a few years and um, I remember picking PJ Marrow twice, you know? Right. I, PJ is a, was a great chatter. You know, yes. he's chat and fantastic. I just love having him uh, in the taxi. The journey was shocked enough. He was the airport to GPA building, maybe. All right. We, we sit outside the GPA building, forget he had an appointment. He said, with Charlie Hockey, it was an exciting time. All okay. the time. He said, all the time, you know? He said, just so fantastic. No, he didn't tell me any secrets or anything. No, he, 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 I, I, I interviewed I, him I, in his house. I think he genuinely loved that. Oh, he did. I, I interviewed him in his house in Wellington Road at the, start, the beginning of this project a few, good few years ago. Yeah. And he said exactly the same to me as he said to you, Pat, that it was an exciting time. I know we talked about how they kind of first met and we talked about the famous chicken and chip circuit in the 70s. And then about when he was his um, uh, his uh, government press uh, secretary yeah. in the uh, in the 80s and, and a very close advisor. Uh, and even then in the uh, in the aftermath of... Um, the, of the, the tribunal the, days and politics, and uh, Marla was a very um, he was a close confidant and uh, genuine friend, and I, I I would say love is not to uh, uh, and, and, and uh, um, of course uh, Dermot Morgan uh, captured it so well in in Scap he did he did and funnily enough Dermot Morgan's cousin a guy called Donna Morgan was um, hockey's uh, private secretary in the uh, in the late. 80s, who I interviewed I uh, as well, yeah. And so Dermot this, Morgan had a, well, the great lampooning of scrap, uh, of scrap, scrap of Mara. Uh, if uh, oh, he was never too uh, too worried about these things, uh, no, um, he was. Uh, I don't think he really enjoyed it, but he didn't didn't obsess about it uh, about it either. Um, 
but it's interesting like on a human level uh, and eventually he eventually he the cancer gets him in the end in uh, 2006 he dies at home in June uh, of 2006 surrounded by his his loving family I mean and his uh, and Maureen for all the sort of uh, the difficult days of the of the, the, the tribunals and the keen revelations she stayed incredibly well, loyal to him Gary I don't know I, you don't have to answer if you don't want to was she aware of that? I, I will answer it if I can. Um, I, I think she probably was um, to some extent. Um, I'm talking about the affair now rather than the, the sort of the money. Um, yeah. But, um, and you know, I, as I said, I interviewed her and it was, I, you know, that was sort of off limits, reasonable enough. Um, but this was, um, she was a very loyal person to him. She, the week after the Keen thing uh, came on the late, late show, she stayed in the house herself and she went out the following week and people started, you know, doing her shopping, saying hello to her and whatnot. And she went back to hockey and said, we'll say no more of it now and we'll just get on with our lives. And that was in 99 and she, they live, he lived until 2006 and uh, she was a great support of him right uh, to the end. Yeah, I mean, obviously, people have grown, and uh, really, I mean, she was with him for 50-odd years. She was, she was. But it was interesting, I write in the book that some people suggested that how he married her as a sort of uh, avenue into Fianna Fáil, but that was that to deny her any agency, which I think is wrong. Uh, she was a formidable woman from a, a very strong, um, she had a very strong political pedigree uh, herself, um, she was also a great uh, woman for horses. She has, um, yeah, she died in 2017 um, and uh, was, I think, uh, yeah, a very formidable woman in her own right. But it was difficult for her as well, Pat. I mean, it's not, uh, we talk about hockey a lot, but it was it was a difficult time for uh, for her. Looking at the politics side of it, I mean, Fianna Fáil more or less have been in power since the foundation of the state. And Fine Gael have have been in power as well. And that's it. I'm just wondering at this remove why a, a government, an Irish government, hasn't made the point about the occupation of the six counties by a foreign government or the historians, even. Yeah, I mean, Hockey's view, it's interesting in 1979 when he becomes Taoiseach, his first thing is to say, you know, that uh, Irish unity is very much on the cards and he wants to see Ireland uh, unified. Um, he never does a huge amount uh, about it because it's very difficult for the Irish state to do anything about it. Uh, he was against the Anglo-Irish Agreement um, yes. because he thought it was a, in, an insubstantial document. Um, but it was very difficult for him at a personal level to do much with the unionist community or even with the British because he had the uh, the controversy of the arms trial just uh, just a decade yes. earlier. So, Credibility. Yeah, yeah. Well, so he was very keen, and you know the beginnings of the sort of the peace process path in the late uh, uh, in the late nineteen eighties. He is he's quite central to uh, to that certainly, and yeah. he uh, he tries. Um, I mean, Reynolds, to be fair, after him, the Downing Street Declaration makes a big uh, makes a big impact. No. Obviously, you you just briefly you, you wrote that uh, about electoral competition. I mean, there's the rise of Sinn Féin now, as you know, and I have to tell you, you know, being in politics, and uh, they in the last election. But as as we know from elections, that doesn't mean that it'll translate the same way in the next election. You know? Yeah, no, I do. I mean, it's um, how he how he how he would be appalled uh, to see Fianna fall at its low ebb now. Uh, both in percentage wise and seats, and he would also be appalled to see Fianna Fáil in uh, coalition with uh, Fianna Gael. Uh, you remember uh, Alan Jukes uh, dangled that carrot in front of hockey in 1989 uh, yeah. after the um, the then election, which hockey needlessly That's right. That's right. Um, but yeah, and how he would be, he would be very upset to see sort of the. Sinn Féin taking that sort of role of as uh, the Republican Party away from um, from Fianna Fáil. But it's a long race from thirty two seats to eighty. Oh yeah, I mean it's but you know it's interesting. 
Hockey at one stage he even got 47% of the vote. So while we talk about how he never got an overall majority, he still was able to win very large amounts of the, uh, of the vote. Yeah. Whereas the, the, the economic crash of 2011, uh, you know, that's what, or 28, 2008, and then the 2011 election, that's what has done for the modern uh, Fianna Fáil party. It's an interesting point, the idea of they were in government for so long and then do the electorate blame them for the crash and hasn't, uh, well, a, a significant part of it hasn't forgiven it. But how yeah, yeah, it's it's number, be, yeah. you'd be appalled at the result that where they are now. You only had one TD in Dublin. Yeah, Brian Lennon in 2011. That, uh, I live in Dublin West. Uh, <laughs> I mean, when, so when that's the, uh, it was in my constituency. I mean, they've had a small bit of a bounce back. Uh, but, you know, all... And, and of course, hockey's own son, Sean, um, lost his seat in 2011. He got it back and holds it still. Got it back in 16 and held it in 20. Um, but these are difficult days for uh, for Fianna Fáil. But, uh, yeah, and, uh, but as for, for hockey's perspective, I think he would be dismayed. But, but even now, if you add the percentage of Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael, and say in the Greens, they still have a majority for the next sitting. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think uh, sort of may, maybe to end on this note, I, I, I think the the assumption that many people have that Sinn Fein will automatically lead the next uh, uh, government is uh, is dangerously naive in my view, uh, because as you say, Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael, and the Greens currently on polls would 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 beat them. Um, we, of course, PR, STV is a strange old beast and no one knows where the sort of last seats might, uh, yeah, might fall. Fianna Fáil lost, I think, up to at least six or seven seats on the last count. And um, so one can never tell. And, you know, this government, I think, will last. I think it, there's no danger of it collapsing anytime soon because no, none of the three parties want to fight an election. Um, no. they, they'll take Sinn Féin on when the time comes. Um, but I would caution... Or counsel those who would assume Sinn Fein are natural fits, and you know maybe they maybe they will win the next election and will form a government with some uh, some of the other left wing parties. But uh, I wouldn't be. Uh, well, uh, my yeah. opinion is they'd form it with Fianna Fáil quicker than any other party. Well, that's they. I think Sinn Fein would, but the great question is would Fianna Fáil do it? And Michal uh, Martin won't do it. it. Would have to be a different leader than uh, than him, and that would be a huge step for Fianna Fáil to take because the great danger, Pat, as you know, is that smaller parties <laughs> get get colonised by the large ones. Look at the PDs. Look at Labour in twenty eleven. Uh, what happened to them in twenty sixteen and subsequently? So there are great uh, great dangers. Well, Gary, I mean, it's been an absolute blast, and uh, we could go. We could talk well, about. it's been a pleasure talking to you, Pat. I'm very grateful <laughs> that for you giving I, me the I, opportunity to talk to you. And I'm delighted that you took the time out. We might come back later on in a few months' time. Or yeah, or during we, the election, I, I, I'd be delighted. Thanks so much. We won't, we won't wait till the next election, but uh, I was going to say, Hahi, of course, CJ, if you mention CJ in politics, there's only one man you talk about. And Gary's book, I'm delighted it's so successful. What did you, before you finish, when, how long did it take you to write the book? Well, I started researching it in about 2014, um, so seven years ago, but I, I, I wrote it two other books in the meantime and I have uh, I had this job here in DCU as the head of school so yeah. I think on and off probably about seven years but over certainly over the last sort of um, I think from about 2018 on I was working at it pretty much full time and like it's a big book but it's uh, I, I think it reads pretty well and uh, I'm, yeah, I'm very proud of it obviously Murphy I just want quotation here before we finish Murphy is meticulous in sticking to the evidence, but at times his praise goes too far. Uh, yeah, I read that review, and uh, yeah, I mean, I didn't mean to finish that one. Not, not one not at all. All, all I could do is, well, you see, all I can do is go on the evidence. I think all these yeah. myths, and, all these myths and rumors about hockey that people would have grown up with. I mean, my view. And I suppose just to finish on this point, Pat, yeah. what I was trying to do in one way was to humanize Hockey a little bit. Yeah. And he is a sort of great devil, devilish character, sort of like uh, cartoonish in one way. And I was trying to humanize him as a, as a person. And uh, I, I think I've succeeded in that. Well, Professor Gary Murphy, fellow Cartman, 
And uh, but that's only coincidence. But anyway, Gary, it's been a pleasure as I said, for taking your time out of your day to be with us here on Near Confidence and Near Media. And until we meet again, Gary, take care and good luck. Thanks so much, Pat. I appreciate it.